Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon sponsored review time again, which means that someone managed to grab the Patreon slot to make me do Go Kaiger again. We're kind of jumping backwards with this one. We've already done episodes 15 to 21, and we're introduced to two popular characters. Bosco, a villain and traitor to Captain Marvelous, who plays an evil ranger summoning trumpet, the most diabolical of instruments, and Sixth Ranger Guy, a Sentai fanboy who, after almost dying, was visited by a bunch of dead people and told to kill things to save the world. He is somewhat spectacular, according to the fan subs. And naturally, because we're going back to episode 14, first, he is absent here. Let's dig into Kaizoku Sentai Gokaiger episodes 14 and 22 to 24. We open episode 14 with our crew of pirates napping on the bridge. As I grow older, never have I related more to these characters. Navi dreams of being in a really crappy PlayStation 2 racing game before waking up, hitting its head, and reporting to the team what's up. Ah, so next we're doing a jaywalking themed Sentai. Don't worry, Navi. I know thanks to Gamera movies how important that is for a better world. They may be very civilized up there, more than we are here on Earth, hmm. with no wars or traffic accidents. Oh yeah, Pirate Queen Zheng Yi Sao was infamous for stopping at red lights. Aboard the Zangyak flagship, Wolves Gill is informed of how in one of their recent monster attacks, said monster was berated for crossing a red light by some guy. You know your invasion is going badly when random citizens are able to shame your forces for not using the crosswalk. At this point, screw the pirates, you guys are the alien invaders all the other galactic empires make fun of. After the opening theme, we get our episode title. It's still time for traffic safety. It's nice when the episode title of your superhero show can double as the title of a 50s educational short. In Sarn, one of the Zangyak generals is apparently quite smitten with random traffic guy. There's another monster, Zelisto. Yes, yes, I looked it up and apparently his name is actually Jellisto, but I'm going with what the fan subs say. Who's equally taken with In Sarn, even revealing in his flashback that in space, they also have cheesy anime high school love stories and that he swore to do anything for her. As such, she asks him to capture traffic guy for her. And indeed, we cut to the guy trying to give a traffic light lesson to a bunch of little kids who all disappear when he isn't looking. Traffic Sentai Cross Garger. To further illustrate how pathetic the Zangyak are, this guy is able to evade the Zangyak foot soldiers Zelisto brought with him, just kind of shoving them aside. So I'm guessing they were conquering planets of pacifists before this, right? Anyway, following along with Navi's prediction, the Gokaijers are going around with a book on traffic laws yelling at anyone who breaks them. They spot the guy getting chased and help him out, even changing into Zhu Ranger during it. <laughs> now if only they did that to anyone who ran a red light. <laughs> That is logic in what he says. After Zelisto runs away, the traffic guy introduces himself. He's actually Janai, aka Red Racer, from the Sentai Car Ranger, which got adapted into Power Rangers Turbo here. And that really explains the mood of the episode, as Car Ranger was a comedy Sentai, kind of a parody of the franchise at the time. Since the Car Rangers lost their powers in the Legendary War, he's been working as an actor. The Fast and the Furious movies are about to get even more ridiculous and amazing! He says he'll reveal the true power of the Car Rangers if they form an acting troupe with him. I used to be part of one already with this girl named Sadako Yamamura, but, uh... 
Well, let's just say it was a good thing that I got sick on opening night and stayed home. I need you to play the people who get run over. They say that they'll take their chances with the other car rangers and run off. Insarn still watching this and still in love with Red Racer. Well, you could probably report her for dancing when she should be running the ship. At least I presume that's what she was doing. Did everyone else go home for the day? The Gokai just split up to get away from Janai, but Doc can't decide which way to go, so the Red Racer catches up to him. However, Zelisto comes in with his fiery jealousy to try to kill him, although banter leads to the two heroes just sitting down. Well, have you seen the Zangax track record so far today? I'm pretty sure Doc could just go and push you the hell over at this rate. He tries to kill them with fireballs, but Insarn beams down to defend her crush. And by that I mean Zelisto starts launching fireballs at him, and she picks Janai up, wherein he transforms into a mannequin to be spun around by her. Classic love triangle situation. Zelisto, this is not a healthy way of dealing with rejection by your crush. The other Gokaijers reunite with Doc. <laughs> I love how the plot really has nothing to do with them, and they should just consider going to lunch. After pondering what the hell this all means, Insara finally yells at them to help protect Janai, so they morph and... Oh, I guess they went on their lunch break during the morphing sequence. No, they just move to a higher point and the fight proceeds. Naturally, there's only one Sentai to change into for this situation. And then they switched to Car Ranger afterwards, but I think they should have kept going with the gag, run through like every vehicle-themed Sentai, then do Turbo Ranger again until finally getting it. Okay, considering they're doing other modes of transportation other than cars here, I can see why they were confused and did Turbo Ranger first. Janai starts rejecting Insara's advances, leading her to get on top of him and try to kiss him. Maybe where you're from, here, we roll for it. He kicks her off, and the rest of the Zangyak leadership finally wander back onto the set to watch this and also wonder what the hell is going on. Wars Gill ends these shenanigans by making Zelisto grow giant-sized. That's funny, I thought that's what was already happening in his pants. He gets Insarn's attention, and Janai finally tells them off. Baka! Koiwa! It's true, I've learned the hard way that women don't like it when you scream about Marville on dates. Well, most of them anyway. For one, that was a turn-on. I mean, technically isn't that what Insara was doing when she got on top of you? I don't think we should encourage that. No, the solution is for him to get on one knee and declare his love, Insara actually returning the gesture in kind. There's your proper relationship advice for the day, you and your partner need to be open and honest about your feelings. And in this case, one of them is horny for someone else. This is a weird episode, okay? I love you! I love What am I watching? I don't know, but I hate it. Zelisto is so happy about this that he tries to smash the Gokaijers. Joy about love means crushing ants underfoot. They summon the Megazord, shoot him a bit, and it looks like Team Rocket's blasting off again. He gets sent back up to War's Gill's ship, and Insara is pissed at him now because he was defeated so easily. After that, Zelisto would start joining in cell forums. Our heroes finally agree to do Shakespeare in the Park with Janai, acting out his little traffic play, and ultimately winning over the kids watching. Oh, but wait until you come across someone who didn't signal a left turn, Navi. Anyway, let's move on from whatever the hell that was to episode 22, A Falling Promise. We open with Guy revealing that he's finished his self-published Super Sentai encyclopedias. Wait, if this is for Super Sentai, why is there an entire section on Spider-Man? What the hell is a Leo pardon? He wants them all to study up on it, since in the last episode, there was a mix-up over which team they were changing into, and he'd like to ensure they don't do that again. Doc and the women are very impressed, while Joe says he needs to go do some shopping. And theme song! Grocery shopping and the Encyclopedia Sentaica. We're in for a wild ride on this one, people! Guy asks Joe what his favorite things are about Earth. Digital watches, amateur traffic safety videos, there's a lot to love. 
A kid on a bicycle nearly collides with Guy before proceeding on to a temple, where the kid spots some Zangak taking... I don't know, Eclipso's diamond? The monster identifies it as a fragment of the Power Stone, and they soon spot the kid, chasing after him. He runs back to our heroes, who morph and fight them. Guy suggests doing the Dinosaur Sentai, resulting in him becoming the Green Jew Ranger, and Joe the Blue Abba Ranger. <laughs> God damn it, Joe, we get a plus four to our attack stat when we're from the same group. Dude, you gave it to him like 10 minutes ago. And even then, he's gonna be mad you didn't include a CD with Bandora's Dance Party album for the Zhu Ranger section. After the monster retreats, they check up on the kid, who scraped his knee when he was running away. He doesn't care, though, saying that he needs to get to Mount Kamikura, having made a promise to his friend Daigo to watch the meteor shower with him. He's been bicycling for half a day to reach it. Oh my. Our heroes, everybody! Joe bandages the kid's leg and tells him to get a move on so he can keep his promise. However, the two don't think he'll make it in time. <laughs> Unfortunately, those type of idiots tend to be into crypto. They head back to the galleon and... I guess they have cameras on their outfits or something because they review the fight footage and spot the Power Stone. Kinda looks like a Robomat tail. Poor dopes don't know they can buy the whole Robomat via my store envy. And yes, I will continue to shamelessly shill my store, why do you ask? Custom colors now available. It's one of two stones, the Ghostly Stone and the Child's Stone. According to legend, the Child's Stone continually cries out for its parent, the Ghostly Stone, but said parent never returns. That's because if the two stones are ever reunited, it'll be the end of the world. So probably best not to turn them into castanets. The other half of the stone is supposed to be located at Mount Kamikura, Joe and Doc realizing that the kid is heading right into where the Zangyak will be. And indeed, the monster is already there and located the other stone. They're not looking to destroy the Earth. Rather, they believe that this is a source of unimaginable power that they want to nab for themselves. The monster puts the stones together. <laughs> Diarrhea is like a storm raging inside of you. Our heroes engage the foot soldiers, Joe and Guy soon coming across the kid again. They tell him to turn back, that his friend won't be there because of all that's happening, but the kid refuses, flashing back to when he made the promise with his friend. Said friend was injured and was no longer able to play soccer, but they swore to meet up again in a year for the meteor shower, and the kid thinks this will give his friend motivation to get better and be there too. Joe encourages him to go despite the risk, telling Guy that they just will have to clear the Zangyak. And indeed, they do just that, eventually reaching the peak and the monster who's finished absorbing the energy. He uses it to grab a meteor. Dude, thanks, but we didn't need you to supply the meteor for the shower. The Gokaiger say that all they have to do then is destroy him to make him lose control of the meteor. Gokai Reto. Gokai Blue. Gokai Yellow. TikTok, guys! I think you can skip the roll call before the rock falls and everyone dies! After some fighting, he's grown giant-sized and spots the kid approaching. Fuck, I could watch kids fall off bikes all day. I don't give a shit about you, kid. They summon their Megazord and keep the monster from attacking the kid, Joe encouraging him to keep his promise despite his injured leg. The monster is destroyed, but the meteor's already entered Earth's atmosphere. As such, Guy tells Joe to do a fastball special with his mech, launching him into the rock and drilling through it to save the day. The kid is reunited with his friend. Well, the scrolling text on the bottom of the screen helped push me along. And indeed, the friend's leg got better and he plays soccer again. The dream of piloting a giant robot and being launched at an asteroid that you have to drill through. Yeah, this is all heartwarming and stuff until you remember that that kid has to bike back to Tokyo now. Anyway, on to episode 23, Human Lives Are the Earth's Future. Criswell predicts! We start on the Galleon, with everyone just doing their own thing, when Ahim, the pink Gokaiger, pricks her finger. This gets the attention of Luka, the yellow Gokaiger, who helps her with it. The others commenting that Luka acts as a big sister to the entire team, but she especially seems to be nice to Ahim. So, how fortuitous that this episode is coming out right before Valentine's Day. Marvelous comes in and has Navi do the treasure navigation thing, slowly compressing its head like a can crusher. 
Daddy? Poor thing has injured itself so much that it's tapped into a fortune cookie printer instead. The group splits up to go and find people in need of help. Marvelous lifts an old guy up a long flight of stairs, and Guy gathers a bunch of other old people who need the same. Why are there so many stairs? Doc and Joe come across a woman who drops an earring, and I'm pretty sure this is going for a transphobic joke given their reaction to this person's flirty response. So we're gonna skip over anything to do with this! Ahim helps a little girl wet a washcloth for her pregnant mother. She and Luca talking to her causes a flashback where we learn that Luca lost her little sister, Fia, when she was younger. The woman evidently starts going into labor, leading to another woman to come by and hail a taxi for them. However, before they can get going, Zangyak foot soldiers pop out. Yeah, one of the parts they don't tell you about pregnancy and health classes is when the aliens try to steal your baby. While our heroines morph and engage them, the woman who hailed the taxi recognizes them. Luca gets partially injured during the fight, but she brushes off any concern about it. However, they do still head to the hospital to check up on the pregnant woman, learning from her that the woman who called the taxi was Tatsumi Matsuri, a famous EMT. And she's especially famous because she was Go Pink from the Sentai Go Go 5, aka the Sentai that became Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue in America. The other Go Kaijers are too busy with their own subplots to come, but Tatsumi is soon attacked by the Zangyak again. Ahim and Luka are able to fight them off, until who should show up but Bosco. He says he borrowed some of the Zangyak foot soldiers for this. Thought you couldn't gain something without giving something up, dude. Or did the Zangyak have a rental service for these guys that you paid for? Well, if it was a rental, then he's not getting his deposit back, since he just has Sally the monkey start smacking the foot soldiers around for some reason. He says he wants the ultimate power from Gopink, saying that he'll let the injured kid she's tending to go to the hospital if she cooperates. She agrees, but the Gokaijers do not, shoving her back in the ambulance. Luke explains that the kid needs an EMT right now, just as she did with her sister, but she had no idea what she was doing at the time and her sister died. Luca suggests trading clothes with Tatsumi to pretend to be her, but Ahim says he'll see right through that, insisting also that she help with the plan in some way because she can't just sit around being protected by Luca all the time. Tatsumi seems to go out and the ambulance is permitted to leave, but I guess Bosco didn't clean his trumpet because his attempt to steal the ultimate power from her fails. It's soon revealed that it's Ahim. <laughs> It's magic! She doesn't have to explain it. The two are forced to fight the extra heroes Bosco has at his command until they use the Kamehameha on them. Fortunately, the rest of our heroes finally catch up. They morph and fight, going into Go Go 5, and yet again, I'd like to point out that this is an episode that could have been adapted into Power Rangers Megaforce. Especially since they never actually morphed into Lightspeed Rescue ever, except in a special extended edition of the final episode. Power Rangers Megaforce may not be my most hated of the franchise, but it's certainly the dumbest when it comes to its creative decisions. Bosco unleashes a fire monster from Sally's little stomach safe. I still don't get how that works. Is it a Pokeball or something? To distract them while he makes Makes his escape. The ultimate power for GoGo -Go 5 gets released for them, which opens up a bunch of fire hoses inside the big robot that extinguish the fire monster's flames. And probably flooded a good chunk of the city, but what you gonna do? Monster gets blown up, the fastest labor, delivery, and recovery ever happens, sexual tension between Luca and Ahim, and we're moving on to our final episode today, Foolish Earthlings. In today's episode, the Gokaijers fight Invader Zim. While our heroes try to figure out what to have for lunch, Guy finally getting them to go for Takayaki, we catch up with Zelisto, who apparently got kicked out of the Zangyak and hangs out on a pile of garbage. He hasn't eaten in a while and smells some Takayaki, and the owner offers it to him, but... Also, here's a weird thing. I mean, a different weird thing from the weird thing that just happened. They use CGI to animate Zelisto eating since, you know, it's a rubber suit without a movable mouth. I've never seen that before. After the theme song, we meet Senden, a monster who's making a big presentation about conquering the Earth. Unfortunately, Wars Gill gets bored by all this and falls asleep. Although maybe he couldn't follow it because of all the orange text under the fan subs. Damaris tells him to just deploy without the big project plan. The Gokaijers, meanwhile, head to the Takayaki stand Guy recommended, only to find the guy who owns it training Zelisto like he was a dog. He even gives him belly rubs. The other go Kaijers, of course, recognize Zelisto and want nothing to do with him. So they decide to turn back. 
We're learning a lot about everybody's kinks today, and I don't think that's a good thing. Senden starts distributing propaganda material to regular people, talking of how glorious the Zangyak are, and ends up at the park. Finding Zelisto. He's pissed that Zelisto is reducing himself to being a human's pet when he's trying to show off to humanity the superiority of the Zangyak. I love how both Zelisto episodes are just the Gokaijers scratching their heads and going, do we even need to be here? Our heroes morph and engage the foot soldiers, forcing Senden to retreat. Afterwards, Zelisto tries to explain why he was the guy's pet. Yeah. Guy gets the Takayaki chef to not keep aliens as pets and to apologize to Zelisto. Doc suggests that if he really wants to earn food, why not become an apprentice Takayaki chef to the guy? The chef says that that's dependent on his mom, who it turns out is the woman who dumped some garbage on him earlier. However, it turns out she's a big old bigot, thinking aliens are dirty and awful, and refuses to share Earth's Takayaki cooking with an alien. This is a show about space pirates! Sandin and his foot soldiers storm in, demanding vengeance, and Marvelous tells him to knock it off. They have more important things to discuss. So, do you think this episode's gonna make it into Guy's Encyclopedia? Sandin gets pissed, however, when he learns that the woman called Zelisto trash, even though, as Joe points out, Zangyak threw him out with the trash, and he calls off the ceasefire to try to shoot her with a bazooka. The Gokaijers morph, and thanks to the commercial break, are suddenly in an industrial site instead of that woman's house. Space is warped and time is bendable. Zelisto leaps into the path of a bazooka shot meant for the woman, making her realize how foolish her prejudice was. They mourn him for five seconds. <laughs> That's not from Zelisto, that's the suit actor giving notes to the director. After a final wave and a giant robot fight, Senden is destroyed. And so our episodes end with the Gokaijers meeting up with the Takayaki chef and, for some reason, Eric Satie's Gymnopode number one is playing as the background music? <laughs> Don't know why they decided to go for melancholy for this brief bit, but the Takayaki chef reports that Zelisto has eloped with his mom, and they have opened a hot springs resort. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but this is kind of a goofy episode! And the Gokaijers, upon hearing this, just walk away without saying a single word in reaction. Even they have realized that it's best to move on from this plot. These episodes continue to be very good, even if the Zelisto ones are very silly. We've certainly had some silly moments on Gokaiger before, but I feel like this is the first time we've had straight-up comedy episodes, and yeah, while some of the bits are rather wince-inducing, stuff like Senden being told, we're not dealing with you asshole aliens right now, we have more important things to worry about, are wonderful in their absurdity. The other two episodes give us the chance for some character development, particularly for Luca. Now obviously I haven't reviewed every episode of Gokaiger, and there's a big gap between episodes 5 and 14 that I haven't covered, but it says something that in the 16 episodes I've looked at with this show, this is the first time that either Luca or Ahim has gotten any character focus. Maybe there was something in those nine episodes I haven't looked at yet, but it was nice to remember that we have other characters, and we get some backstory for them and learn more about their interpersonal relationships. Seeing Luca as the big sister of the group makes me reevaluate her behavior in past episodes, where her attitude just seemed kind of standoffish or snarky, but in thinking of her in that kind of role makes a lot more sense, and I love that. And it feels like Joe got some more depth to him, even though I still don't know much about his own backstory. Again, maybe that's covered in the intervening nine episodes I haven't looked at between then and now. But that encouragement of the kid despite the danger while still maintaining his stoic attitude is great. An eclectic and somewhat bizarre selection of episodes, but pretty damn good. Next time, we've seen how Star Wars A New Hope was adapted when they had barely anything to work with, so let's see how its sequel fared in the Empire Strikes Back adaptation.
Someone in a nearby office building is looking out at this giant monster on one knee, declaring his love for someone on the ground and thinking, you know, this is weird even for this country. Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching.